Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Fuel the Pedal podcast. I am your host, Gabriel Martins, and this is episode number 10, an episode dedicated exclusively to a specific food and its possible yet forgotten role in recovery, rehydration, and repair and cycling. We are talking about milk, of course, a food that was once idolized, but in the past few years, it has been somewhat of a punch bag with unfounded ideas that may have contributed for milk's reputation to drastically decrease, even in the sports setting, where plant-based alternatives appear to have conquered cyclists, even the ones not having any symptoms of lactose intolerance. And as usual, before getting into the good stuff, here are the latest news in the cycling world. This time, shorter than usual, because all eyes are now on the Tour de France. Igan Bernal, with only 22 years of age, is the third youngest winner of the Tour de Suisse. The Colombian rider is considered as one of the cycling's most talented young professional riders, and in the upcoming Tour de France, Bernal is expected to be riding in the support of his Ineos team captain last year's Tour de France winner, Geraint Thomas. The 2019 Tour will go through two countries, Belgium and France. It will visit the three Belgian regions of Brussels, Capital, Flanders and Valois and 37 departments of France. And just before the Grand Depart, I will be there in Brussels, but not specifically for the Tour de France. I will be attending the 2019 Science and Cycling Conference, which will be held in Brussels on the 4th and 5th of July. This is an international conference in conjunction with the start of the Tour de France. And during the conference, experts from the competitive cycling world and scientists will exchange the latest research and experiences. The participants will consist of researchers, doctors, nutrition experts, sports directors, cycling organizations and many representatives of cycling teams such as Team Dimension Data, Team Sunweb, UAE Team Emirates and Team Jumbo Visma. Last year I had the pleasure to be one of the speakers in the 2018 edition held in Nantes and this year I will be presenting two posters in the form of infographics that our research group from Madrid was able to publish on the British Journal of Sports Medicine. I will be also chairing three talks from one of the sessions, two of them from some Brazilian research colleagues from the University of Sao Paulo who I'm really looking forward to meet. Brian Saunders is one of them and he's going to present a year in the life of a Brazilian professional female road cycling team, part one, performance measures, whilst Patricia Campos Ferraz is going to present part two of this talk on the nutrition and clinical outcomes part. Other Brazilian research colleagues such as Luana Farias de Oliveira is going to talk about the relationship between skeletal muscle carnosine content and cycling sprint performance. And Pedro Perim is presenting a poster on sports supplement use in Brazilian cyclists. Where is the information coming from? It's great to see nutrition being approached with such quality and in such specific contexts by the hand of Brazilian researchers who are clearly putting a very strong focus on this area. Please bear with my enthusiasm highlighting the talks from my fellow Portuguese-speaking colleagues, but I feel that this year is going to feel like home for me. Other than this, I'm really excited to seeing again Stephen Chung, who's been here on the podcast talking about thermal stress and heat adaptation in cycling, with whom I've been cooperating since then on Pez Cycling News with a monthly article on nutrition. And also Peter Leo from the University of Innsbruck, whom I met last year, and on this edition he's going to talk about power profiling in elite under-23 riders during a competitive season. Moving on to the topic you'll all hear for, I assume, to help us understand a bit more about the role of milk and why are we talking about this specific food, I've brought Lewis James from the University of Loughborough. Lewis is a senior lecturer and researcher in nutrition within the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University, and he's a member of the National Center for Sport and Exercise Medicine East Midlands. His research focuses on the interaction between exercise and water balance, with current projects examining the impact of acute and chronic exposure to hypohydration and dehydration on exercise performance, post-exercise recovery, and training adaptations in in a variety of athletic populations. 
Additionally, Lewis's research explores the health effects of alterations in human water balance. Lewis has a keen interest in combat sports, and alongside his research in human water balance, he examines the health and performance consequences and of recovery from rapid weight loss in combat athletes. Additionally, Lewis has worked and is working as a consultant to many elite athletes and teams on issues related to water and electrolyte balance. So, the questions we are looking to answer here today are What makes milk such a unique food to be considered? How does it compare to other plant-based alternatives? How does milk perform when compared to other fluids in post-exercise rehydration? How can chocolate milk help in glycogen resynthesis and delayed onset muscle soreness reduction? Can milk be useful when trying to cut weight for competition? All this and much more up next on episode number 10 of Fuel the Pedal podcast. Hi, Lewis. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. How are you doing? Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Gabriel. Thanks for the invite. Lewis, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here on Feel the Pedal podcast. It was a real pleasure when you accepted my invitation. It almost sounds minimalistic to make an episode based on one specific food, but this one deserves it for the reasons we are about to get into. So, uh, Lewis, shall we start by uh, having you presenting yourself, your academic background and the research you've been performing so far? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm I'm a senior lecturer and researcher based at Loughborough University in the UK. Uh, I guess initially my my first degree was actually in food science, and then I transitioned towards um, sports. Since sports was my was my was my passion, and I guess the the main area of my research is is around fluid balance and and exercise, and also health now, um, and that's really where my kind of research in milk and and, and milk derived proteins and ingredients came from um, when starting to try and unpick how how milk by, might be used as a, um, a fluid to consume after exercise to enhance um, post-exercise rehydration. Um, and yeah, I guess that's me. <laughs> okay, perfect, Lewis. It was precisely some of that research on the role of milk as a, a post-exercise recovery drink that has caught my attention in the past years and led us to be here today talking about this. And I don't really fancy talking about specific foods in isolation, but we as nutritionists are often bombarded with, uh, you know, reductionist questions regarding particular foods, such as what do you think of an avocado? What do you think of chia seeds? What do you think of salmon? Um, but this one, I think it deserves a podcast episode just about it. Because uh, in the last decades, and probably you've noticed this as well, milk has gone through some rough times. Milk is perhaps experiencing its lowest reputation in the history of mankind. It was once a food uh, praised for its role in children's growth and has importance throughout the life cycle and started its downfall when the paleo diet came in, I think, challenging the idea that milk wasn't appropriate for human consumption because it wasn't made for human consumption. And this hype was then amplified when in 2011, uh, the Harvard University launched the Healthy Eating Plate, which uh, recommended a more moderate milk ingestion or one or two doses uh, or glasses uh, daily and suggested that there were other sources of calcium besides dairy products only. Uh, a message that was then uh, misinterpreted and exaggerated to fit in the standards of this newly created diet trend that still persists. Doubts about the real value of milk caused controversy. This has led people and probably in some way athletes to question the value of milk as a safe food, which gave rise to an invasion of plant-based alternatives to milk that play little resemblance to the nutrition profile of milk, but rather came to give a response to the demand of people seeking healthier alternatives, or so they think. Still, these plant-derived drinks have undoubtedly provided many more alternatives for lactose-intolerant people and lactose-intolerant athletes, and enjoy a healthy reputation, I must say. Even in athletes who are not lactose-intolerant, the belief that they are in some ways healthier or superior to milk. 
Regardless, when it comes to consuming supplements derived from milk, such as whey protein, casein, or recovery drinks that may have milk protein powder in their composition, athletes and sports people in general seem to conveniently forget the demonized status of milk and consume them religiously at the end of any exercise session, or else the anabolic window will be lost, or a muscle won't recover as well in the case of endurance exercise such as cycling. Anyway, milk still remains quite unpopular in athletes' perception, irrespective of the solid body of evidence attributing important benefits to its inclusion in the athlete's diet, particularly in the post-workout endurance sessions, as we will discuss here today with Dr. Lewis James, who has been giving an important contribution for milk research as a recovery drink in the last years, and hopefully we can clarify and increase milk's reputation, at least among cyclists. After all, we are probably talking about the biggest bang for your buck in terms of sources of high-quality protein. So, Lewis, what's your perspective on this whole decadence of milk in the past years, all the negative things it has been associated with, and what makes milk such a unique food to be considered in the sports context, particularly in endurance sports such as cycling? Thanks for that, Gabriel. I think the first thing to kind of say in terms of framing our conversation today is that, you know, my position isn't that um, everyone should consume milk. <laughs> Or at all opportunities, it's not a question of one food against another. Um, I think it's it's a it's an important you know food group for or you know milk and dairy really because we're talking about milk, but more widely dairy products. You know they're they're an important food group for a number of vital nutrients for many populations sure. uh, across the globe, um, and they are one of many foods that can be used in in certain settings. I think the 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 benefit of milk for the athlete particularly is is the convenience and the cost. Those are the two things that, that make it a really um, good viable option for recovery in many athletic situations, in, including endurance sports and cycling. In terms of the kind of reputation of milk, I guess, over the years, there's far more evidence on the kind of positive side of health benefits for milk. If we're looking at, you know, cardiovascular disease, bone health, all of these different uh, factors of, of health, aging, um, you know, regulation of muscle mass, providing protein for that sort of thing, calcium in growth, all of these sort of things. And I think my view is that demonizing any food group is a negative thing, um, particularly in the case of food groups that are really common parts of people's daily diet. Um, you, you tend to see that if, if somebody who is not appropriately educated or doesn't have the requisite knowledge to replace that food or food group with other sources that contain the nutrients that are con you know, within that food or food group, then you know, they're at risk of, of some level of deficiency, whether it's marginal or, or, or full deficiency. So I think demonizing a food group and removing any food group from somebody's diet is, is often a negative thing, unless that's that's set up with a kind of appropriate advice and information on how to how to replace what's what's in that food in the context of sport the, the really interesting thing with milk is that there's so much research out there now that supports its use for many different aspects of of recovery i will say that mostly it is in the post-exercise recovery period that milk does have benefits I can't think of many situations where it would be probably a, a positive thing to consume milk during exercise. How easily it's digested, the speed with, with which it moves through the GI tract, things like that could set up perhaps some GI disturbances during exercise that might not necessarily be a positive. Um, so it's post-exercise that we're looking at. And I think when you look across the various different aspects of recovery, milk almost interacts with, with all of those. Traditionally, I guess in sports nutrition, we, we think of the, the three R's of recovery you know so you've got kind of resynthesis of, of glycogen you've got um, you know re remodeling of muscle protein um, and you've got uh, rehydration of uh, lost water stores and milk can actually uh, either have a beneficial effect on most of those or at least be as good as other sources of nutrients um, but also beyond that I think there are other aspects of recovery that we don't talk about that much in nutrition um, so for example managing post-exercise muscle soreness and and also thinking about post-exercise energy intake I, I can't think of words that start with R to uh, to make them the five R's but mm. they, they would be my kind of five pillars of post-exercise nutrition and recovery um, um, and milk interacts with all of those. And hopefully we can get into some of those in more detail with, with the, the rest of the questions we'll have in this interview. 
Sure, that's a really balanced message to, to start with and we will surely get into more detail on each of those points. And um, how do you think milk's nutrition profile is compared to other these other plant-based alternatives or even with uh, the sports drinks or a typical recovery drink out there? Yes, we published a recent review in uh, European Journal of Sports Sciences on, on milk kind of post-exercise recovery, uh, focusing on both performance and, and also health uh, aspects. And one of the really useful things was that in the review process for that article, one of the, uh, one of the reviewers made some really useful suggestions. Um, and we had made the argument in the text that milk was a kind of cheap and readily available drink, but it was actually the reviewer um, that suggested including a table that really highlighted the differences. And, and going through that, that table, that process, of putting the table together it really really helped me to kind of uh, cement that idea um, and in that table we've got you know the the main sources or the main kind of forms of milk so skimmed milk which is virtually fat free free semi-skimmed milk or or two percent milk for those um, those listing in the states and full fat milk um, or we should say I guess standardized fat milk because uh, full fat milk doesn't really exist unless you get it straight from the cow um, then we contrasted those against other uh, milks that are available so we used particularly soya almond and rice milk as examples um, and then we also had some examples of recovery products in there and the really um, striking thing is that if you compare the protein content of milk, probably the nutrient that is of most interest in milk, there are others as well, and we can talk about some of those, but it's protein that seems to induce most of the effects that we see in the post-exercise environment. Other than soya milk, we, we see nowhere near comparable protein contents in milk. So, you know, rice and almond milk, t typically less than 0.5 grams of protein per, per 100 milliliters of milk. So that means if you drink a uh, 500 milliliters of the almond or rice milk you're getting less than two and a half grams of protein um, which we we know is is certainly suboptimal for inducing any kind of meaningful effects post-exercise you know milk comes in typically three and a half to 3.6 grams of protein per, per 100 milliliters so that means that if you consume uh, in the uk we still have pints i know in in europe you won't necessarily have those but if you consume around 600 mils of milk or one one pint which is 568 mils you you get 20 grams of protein which is is what we kind of typically recommend to in, induce kind of effects on muscle protein uh, post-exercise it's funny because I have that article uh, right here with me. <laughs> I've been with it since I began the, the podcast here. And uh, yes, and that table really helps uh, summarize all the differences. There are at least the main nutritional difference in all the macronutrients. I especially like the part where you've included the price as well. And not only per, per liter, but per grams of protein. It's actually really good to put things in in perspective. And when we see, for example, the rice milk, the price, it's, it's in pounds for for 20 grams of protein it's it's huge compared to to the other ones it's curious yeah i think it was a really uh it was an interesting statistic that we came up when we put that table together and i think um it really does help to highlight the the effects of different sources of milk whether it's dairy milk or whether it's you know non non-dairy alternatives mm -hmm. And that they really do differ in in what they get. I mean, the, the nice thing to see is that soya milk is is clearly a, um, a comparable, at least in macronutrient composition and, and approximate price. It performs fairly comparable to dairy milk. Um, I mean, some of the evidence suggests in some parameters of recovery it doesn't doesn't perform quite as well. Um, and then I think the interesting, the, the other interesting thing is comparing it to the traditional recovery products. And these were all recovery products that we can get from from the supermarket, so all sourced from supermarkets in the UK. And and again, when you look at that that price per 20 grams of protein you're looking at at least five times the cost for a lot of those recovery products yes. to get the same amount of protein which if you're an athlete who is on a budget you know a lot of the athletes that that, that we work with or see our student athletes and you know money's tight for those individuals you know or young athletes that are trying to make it if you can get the same benefit for a fifth of the cost or very similar benefits for a fifth of the cost then it's a really attractive opportunity or option for that for that athlete yeah sure and people tend to forget so much about this aspect and and we as sports nutritionists we we have to make sure that the minimal cost possible in the diet so anytime we are you know prescribing or giving people these new functional foods in new supplements we sometimes we forget about this how important it is to to take into account the cost as well and milk consumption may actually be a cost-effective strategy 
Also, the re- ready availability. I mean, you yeah. can pretty much walk into a shop on any street in any part of the world, and you can you can pick up you know half a liter of milk that will give you most of what you need for post exercise. The the downside, and there are there aren't it's not all positives, I guess. The the practical downside of using milk in that sort of environment is that obviously um, milk does spoil, so you need to be able to store it in in a um, in a fridge. Sure. Um, I guess in the context of cycling, that's not so bad because most people will normally cycle to and from somewhere, um, and that that place is often there where they live. So normally there's a fridge there where, where the milk can be stored. You don't necessarily want to be uh, keeping the, the milk on the bike if you're out for a, a five hour ride in the heat. Um, it's not going to it's not yeah, going to sure. taste that good by the end of that that five hours. Yeah, even in pro cycling, there are ways of storing uh, milk in the cycling trucks. So that part, I think it would be more or less covered. Regarding milk and milk derived protein supplements such as whey protein and, and casein, which are the most popular among athletes, considering the particular nature of cycling and the, the endurance type stimuli that may be different from that of the resistance exercise, is muscle protein synthesis an equally important factor for an endurance athlete who aims to improve recovery as it is for a resistance athlete who might seek to increase muscle mass where does milk and milk derived supplements fit in this equation yeah i mean i'm i'm by no means an expert on this and i know you've had Stuart phillips on the uh, on the podcast um recently and and certainly he probably one of the you know best sources of information for this this type of question but my view is that you know we always think about muscle protein synthesis but but really it's the turnover of muscle protein that's probably important um and all components within the muscle are are relevant and the nice thing about humans is that we're so adaptable so to so many different stimuli whether that's environment or whether it's exercise and stimulating that turnover the process of breaking down old protein and rebuilding perhaps you know more you know user friendly proteins to to be able to adapt to whatever that stimulus in this context exercise is um, is a really important process so you know the, the cyclist is going to need other things so maybe maximizing you know muscle size and volume isn't necessarily going to be the the goal of all cyclists or, or many cyclists but having a more functional muscle that you know has more mitochondria is you know higher content of various enzymes that allow you know really high high rates of oxidative metabolism all those things are going to be important to a cyclist and 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 they're going to be happening post exercise and in in response to training um, and then there may be some some involvement of you know protein and, and milk derived proteins within within that relationship i think most of the information we have on muscle protein synthesis and protein you know turnover is is derived from uh, from resistance exercise yeah. and there are there are a small number of studies that have looked specifically at sports like cycling one of my colleagues carl holston working with garrett van Haal in in copenhagen has done one of those studies and certainly they i think in that study they used whey protein um, and, and they saw you know changes in muscle protein synthesis synthesis increases in muscle protein synthesis post-exercise when when whey protein was was supplied so you, you do seem to be able to induce some stimulus with providing protein post-exercise for cycling as well um, and that's only going to be a beneficial thing i think in terms of remodeling what's there within the muscle Okay, great. My question really stems from that fact that most of the research that we have on protein requirements or optimal protein requirements to induce training adaptations on athletes are, are based on resistance exercise and not as much on endurance exercise. So I, anytime I have an opportunity, I ask this question because uh, I think we're still uh, lacking some, some research, you know, at least to equalize recommendations. Uh, and I have a question that was actually sent by a good colleague of mine Uh, in Portugal. The question is, it's more regarding the, the, the effect on muscle protein synthesis of milk. And it's regarding the fact that milk also appears to increase muscle protein synthesis, even though in most studies does not reach three grams of leucine per dose provided. What would you say here, Lewis? Is there any other component in milk or in its food matrix that may be responsible for its effect on muscle protein synthesis? Yeah, I think that's a really, really interesting, great question. Um, the, the, the intriguing thing for me about milk is that when you think of it, a lot of what we know about muscle protein synthesis, whilst it's in resistance exercise or in people that are at rest, it's also in, in relation to supplemental protein sources. So it, it, it's whey isolates or concentrates or, 
or it's um, you know casein, um, you know micellar casein, or you know various different concentrated supplemental forms of protein. Um, a lot of that, I believe, is is related to the, the the design of studies that have asked these sort of questions. But when you start to really unpick the literature, looking at milk and milk derived proteins, I think there there probably is something within the the, the matrix of milk that provides some effect if you just look at the proteins that are within milk whey and casein they're the two main ones and and whey is is something like 20 approximately 20 percent of the, the the proteins in milk protein and casein is approximately 80 percent if we look at literature that compares whey and casein at least in a post-exercise setting whey vastly outperforms casein but when we compare milk with those type of proteins it, it seems to give a similar response to whey so the very small amount of whey that's in milk would not be sufficient to, in my view anyway, to exert that beneficial effect on, on at least muscle protein synthesis, um, which suggests to me, and I guess it is fairly speculative, but maybe there is, is something within the food matrix of milk, whether that's, you know, some bioactive peptides or you know, some, something else as of yet un, unidentified that perhaps fills that gap and, and, and pulls the anabolic effects of, of milk up to something like whey. Because if you compare whey against casein, whey drastically outperforms casein, but milk seems to perform at a similar level. Um, so it's a, it's a question I've had in my head as well. Um, and, and hopefully somebody that works specifically in that area uh, will, will be able to unpick some of that for us in, in years to come. This is not a unique case, isn't it? I think there's there's a research on on eggs that found out quite the same. Actually, it was uh, just egg whites versus whole eggs. Yeah, yeah, completely. Nicholas Bird's research group, possibly. Yes, yes. So yeah, I mean, really interesting work. I mean, there's older work on Kevin Tipton who who looked at um, whole milk against skimmed milk and showed yes. that whole milk on a calorie for calorie basis with skim milk performed similarly. Uh, but of course, the um, the protein content of uh, a calorie matched amount of whole milk against skim milk, the protein content is way lower. So on a lower protein dose, whole milk seemed to perform as well as skimmed milk. Um, if we if we look at dose response studies from the, the same labs. Then, then you see that you know those differences in protein, and I mean that, that that study was using you know some some different methods, but they should not perform as well. So yeah, I think from a nutritional point of view, and being a nutritionist myself, it's it's really interesting to think that that whole foods can can have these type of effect. Um, I, I really would be keen to see a lot more data on on whole foods as opposed to you know just the supplemental forms. Looking forward to that as well. And what advantages do you think that may come from in terms of body fat loss in athletes, particularly in endurance athletes? So could this effect vary on male and female athletes? Yeah, I think there, you know, there's 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 data out there that's kind of looked at this in in, in resistance exercise settings. There's a there's a couple of studies that have looked at endurance exercise training and and how milk supplementation or consumption post-exercise might influence body composition and and they generally show favorable favorable results the the, i guess the trend is that the women seem to respond a little bit better in some of those studies so Mm. you see bigger kind of body fat losses in in women compared to men um but i'm not aware of any really good you know meta-analyses that have unpicked whether there's a you know a a statistically significant difference between men and women. Um, it's a question we've been interested in, in for the last few years. We haven't done any long-term studies, but what we have done is try to look at the the acute app- appetitive effects of different post-exercise drinks. Um, and, and we see compar- comparable effects between men and women. And those effects suggest that if you provide somebody with milk after exercise, in the region of 600 mils, so you're getting just over 20 grams of, of protein, and you um, you compare that against a carbohydrate only drink. Um, you know we've done it with uh, orange orange type drinks with females. We've also got some unpublished data in in, in males. Um, what we see is that when when people consume milk after exercise, and then we subsequently let them eat what they want to eat, they they moderate what they consume. So they reduce the energy that they consume after they've had milk in comparison to when they have carbohydrate drinks post exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, and this provides a, a logical link that would, um, you know, connect the studies that have shown milk to positively affect body composition. When I say that, I mean a reduction in body fat post, you know, however, however long training. And these acute responses, if you consume milk, you seem to eat less later in the day. And that in the long run would manifest in a reduction in body body fat. So I think there are there are two effects. Milk seems to increase the amount of muscle uh, in the body. 
at least when consumed after resistance exercise, and there's some evidence for endurance exercise as well, um, and also seems to reduce body fat. And, and I, I believe that that's probably related to to acute appetite effects of consuming milk, um, reducing subsequent food intake, and therefore uh, reducing body fat in the long run. Yes, precisely one of the things that it's here evident on your study, on your review that we were just commenting about. Uh, yeah. uh, besides muscle protein synthesis, besides increasing rehydration, which we will get there in a moment, uh, increasing glycogen resynthesis and diminishing uh, muscle damage and soreness, the, that diminishing in the, the energy intake, it, it is relevant throughout the day. It's not just an, an acute effect, is it? It seems to be, yeah, it seems to be. And I think, you know, that that um, figure in that paper kind of, um, for me, represents my thoughts on post-exercise recovery. I'm, I'm not really aware of many other people really talking about this post-exercise appetite and energy intake response, but it, it's entirely um, you know, relevant for the athlete. Um, because depending on the situation, you know, you perhaps want to differentially affect that response. If you've got an athlete who is struggling to eat enough and you're perhaps wanting to augment their food intake and increase what they actually eat, You want to really dampen that post-exercise appetite response. But if you're most of most of the uh, kind of exercising population, I'm not talking about elite athletes here, but, you know, general population, what you really want to do is is really decrease hunger uh, in response to any nutrition that's consumed around exercise. Um, and I think as a, you know, a practitioner, it's really important to think about the impact of foods supplements and any nutrition plan that you're giving to an athlete in how it's going to influence that subsequent energy intake response but yeah i mean certainly for the maybe the the, the three hours post exercise it's it seems to be relevant and, and we've seen differences 200 kilocalories over that that type of time period you know in in the long run mm -hmm. 12 weeks worth of training that really will probably manifest in, in changes in in body composition And I do have a question about that, and we will get there in a moment. Now into rehydration. And when we are considering rehydration, the first idea that may come to cyclists and coaches' minds is to drink water or perhaps an electrolyte-rich drink uh, in order to replace sweat volume lost during cycling or during a particular workout or race. But there may be more to rehydration than just this. There was a, a really good research paper from your university back in 2007 from Dr. Susan Shirefs uh, comparing water, sports drink, milk and milk with added sodium in rehydrating after a dehydration protocol in the heat with a really good uh, and interesting results in terms of the drink retention when milk was consumed. Could you perhaps get into more detail about the possible role of milk in the rehydrating process post-exercise comparing to other drinks or simply comparing to water? Yeah, I think, you know, this this study um, was probably one of the ones that really got me interested in in, in looking at the efficacy of milk after exercise and, and, and various different um, recovery benefits. Susan was my um, was my PhD supervisor. So, you know, I was in the lab when these these studies oh, were going on. I was I, I was a volunteer it. in the studies, actually. Um, so, yeah, it was it was these studies that kind of really in, intrigued me in this relationship. And I mean, in, in that paper, the the authors, so Susan with um, with Ron Morn and um, and Phil Watson as well, they suggest that the effects are you know possibly related to the energy content of milk or, or perhaps the electrolyte content of milk. But that didn't really ring true with me, in all honesty. Um, so when you look at the electrolyte content of milk, it's it's very comparable to to carbohydrate sports drinks the the numbers that are reported in that study are are mm -hmm. a bit higher um but they you know the rest of the literature every other source for dairy uh, nutrition puts the and every time that i've measured milk it's it's always been similar sodium concentration to what we see in sports drinks typical sports drinks mm -hmm. um also the effect of energy specifically didn't ring true to me because when you look at that study on its own you've got the um the 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 six percent, I think it was, I think it was Powerade they used in this study. So it was a six percent carbohydrate drink. Um, the difference between the water and the carbohydrate drink in energy density was greater than the difference between the carbohydrate drink, the sports drink, and the milk. Yet the milk outperformed the carbohydrate and the water. So the carbohydrate drink and the water by a similar factor. There was no effect of carbohydrate, six percent carbohydrate drink on post-exercise rehydration, which is the first thing to perhaps highlight from that study. You know, so traditional sports drinks, if you're just looking at post-exercise rehydration, don't seem to perform any better than than water. 
but milk outperformed them both. And when I looked at looked at milk, the, the main compositional difference that I see is the protein content of milk. And that led us to do a whole series of experiments looking at how milk proteins and milk derived proteins might influence post-exercise rehydration. And to kind of summarize, probably, I don't know, eight, eight studies we've done maybe in, in that area in, mm-hmm. in a couple of sentences, it seems that when you have intact milk milk protein so the casein and the whey um, that that seems to exert a beneficial effect on post-exercise rehydration Um, whey protein on its own doesn't seem to influence the short period after drinking so that three to four hour period post-exercise there doesn't seem to be a benefit of whey protein on post-exercise rehydration Um, we've got some experiments going on at the moment to extend that post-exercise period and see whether there's anything in 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 a kind of more long-term rehydration effect but we'll wait till those results are published to uh to really go into them in any detail but yeah it seems to be that the protein content for me in milk is has a beneficial effect on rehydration um but the other components of the of the the milk drinks seem to be perhaps having a, a facilitating effect so there are similar amounts of sodium that will have a small effect the carbohydrate that we find in milk lactose is slightly different to what's in traditional um, sports drinks and traditional carbohydrate beverages so we don't know the effects of of lactose but it, it may be that that has a beneficial effect as well hmm. And what would you say about, for example, considering lactose-free milk in terms of rehydration? Would it have the same effect? Uh, I would imagine it would do. Yeah, I mean, lac- lactose-free milk, it depends how it's produced, but if it's, um, if it's lactose-free milk that has essentially um, been enzyme-treated to break down lactose into galactose and glucose, then I would, I would expect very very comparable effects. I think the one thing to consider with the the research that looks specifically at milk and rehydration is that you're consuming very large volumes of milk. And I would question whether that's practically relevant. You know, in these studies, you're talking about an average intake of two liters of milk in one hour. That's quite a large amount of milk. I really like milk personally, uh, but it's, you know, even for me, that would be a, you know, a stretch to consume two liters in, in one hour. Um, so that's where the addition of milk proteins to rehydration drinks could could potentially offer some advantage in that you're not drinking really large amounts of milk. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And when we want to replenish muscle glycogen stores, which is crucial in almost every multi-stage cycling races with the exception of time trials perhaps, the current recommendations state that ingesting 1 to 1.2 grams per kilo per hour of carbohydrate during the first 4-hour period is the best strategy for optimizing this process, while the addition of protein is only beneficial when there's not enough carbohydrate available. I believe 0.8 grams per kilo of carbohydrate per hour plus 0.4 grams per kilo of protein per hour but it seems that there may be some benefit for improving performance on the next day when adding protein to the recovery drink the day before even with the same glycogen resynthesis which is uh, curious in my opinion and it's perhaps where some of your research on chocolate flavored milk may join the party as well could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about this role of protein in the reduction of delayed onset muscle soreness and the role of chocolate flavored milk the, the interesting thing with milk, I think, is that, like you say, that 1.2 grams per kilo per hour for four hours is, is, is a lot of carbohydrate to start with. Um, clearly, milk, and we outline this in the paper, clearly milk cannot provide all of that. It's not feasible to consume that much milk, but the milk in a practical environment could provide some of that carbohydrate that could, you know, top up other sources of carbohydrate and allow a complete amount of carbohydrate to be consumed. I think the um, those studies that have specifically looked at milk and um, chocolate milk and, and glycogen resynthesis, they need to be taken a little bit with a little bit of a pinch of salt, I think. There's nothing magic there. They often provide way less than what is optimal for muscle glycogen resynthesis. Um, I think if you provided adequate carbohydrate, you would probably see a lot of the difference disappear, Mm -hmm. I think. What specifically uh, drives those differences in performance when you, um, you have kind of similar muscle glycogen resynthesis I think is really difficult to pinpoint. You know, there, there could be effects, you know, unmeasured effects on small differences in rehydration or muscle soreness or, or some other, you know, parameter 
liver glycogen resynthesis, for example, you know, as, as, as um, galactose will, will probably preferentially, um, you know, fill the, the liver and that might be important for, for performance. Mm-hmm. You know, things that aren't measured in those studies that might account for that difference. Or, you know, how well blinded were the studies? What was the setup? What were the, 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 the participants that were taking part? What were they told? Because, you know, chocolate milk is pretty, you know, unique and, um, you know, there's certainly it's difficult to blind milk protein containing drinks we've we've done a little bit on that but it's 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 pretty difficult to do and you have to go quite a few stages to do that so there there could be some some placebo effects creeping in there as well but i think for me the the main take home is that from a muscle glycogen resynthesis point of view milk doesn't seem to be any worse than other carbohydrate sources Mm -hmm. Um, so i don't think it's the the area that really i would recommend milk for but it provides carbohydrate that is part of a diet to help resynthesize muscle glycogen, and that could have ergogenic effects for for the athlete. That's where, where the the question I've been eager to to ask comes in, because when I try to uh, provide milk as you know as a cost effective strategy, as a as a convenient and especially as a really palatable strategy as well, because athletes like chocolate milk. When I provide my cyclists with chocolate milk right after, we are aiming to offer this optimal nutrient profile for glycogen resynthesis and rehydration. But some riders, even if they are not lactose intolerant, they do report feeling bloated or excessively full when drinking chocolate milk right after finishing the stage. A few, actually. Most of them, thankfully, tolerate it quite well. We, we must think also, I think, this may condition the other three hours of recovery in which they still need to be consuming food to take advantage of this four-hour window. So um, perhaps do you consider that this individual factor is also important to take into account when trying to talk about what is optimal, but sometimes we have to think about what is possible in a particular uh, context. Would, you, would a, a typical non-milk recovery drink, for example, that has carbohydrate plus uh, protein, uh, be a replacement in this kind of uh, particular riders? Yeah, I guess so. And I think it's, you know, really thinking about um, that individual's other dietary intake as well. Because in, you know, if you if you have got a situation, you know, high performance situation where you really need to optimize that recovery process, you know, planning is always, in my view, the best way to go. Um, you know, and having um, almost a kind of, you know, step by step process that the athlete will go through to to try and, you know, recover appropriately. And I think that that's where you really need to consider the influence of any nutritional intake on subsequent appetite. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe you can you can use, you know, supplemental forms of protein to, to get the, the effects of protein or get the protein you need whilst also using other sources of carbohydrate that exert less effect on appetite um to to get to get that that benefit okay sure and just to clarify things for our listeners there's nothing magical in being chocolate flavored if we have (laughs) vanilla flavored or strawberry flavored it's the same right yeah no difference at all no difference at all uh it's just those those flavored milks generally like you said have have additional um sugar additional sugar in them yeah yeah okay just to make it clear So, um, cycling is a peculiar sport in which we see athletes competing until quite late in their careers. I believe in in the UK they go from Masters A, that goes, it's a category from 30 to 34 years, up to Masters J+, I think, with ages uh, above 75 years of age. And uh, taking into account that the increased anabolic resistance in older people um, that's often reported, uh, could we perhaps assume that milk may have a higher importance in all their cyclists, particularly masters 15, 50, 60 or over, or simply in older amateur weekend warriors, I don't know, that engage in their weekend rides with friends. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, the the kind of almost the uh, unresearched um, group anywhere from 35 up to, you know, 65 doesn't get much attention from a research standpoint. We, 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 we do a lot with young individuals and athletes and then you know we start researching the older to look at their protein requirements but we don't really know what goes on in that middle ground that much um and i think certainly in in those populations appropriate protein intake and also the calcium that milk provides could be really beneficial for those those populations in terms of you know meeting adequate protein intakes optimizing you know the 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 amount of and the function of any any muscle they have 
um, and also promoting recovery. Uh, we would probably speculate that maybe uh, as you and certainly as I've aged, recovery has got more and more difficult. Um, it's, it's difficult to to tease out the, the the reduced training volume that I do now as well. And maybe my fitness is lower. But either way, I think, you know, maybe recovery is a bit more difficult as you age. And therefore, maybe taking a bit more care might be, be something that, that would be really beneficial to, to athletes in those ages. And certainly the effects we talked about on body composition, uh, we have a, a saying in, in the UK, we call them mammals. I don't know if you've heard that over in, in, in Europe, but we call them mammals, which is middle-aged men in lycra. Um, and, you know, <laughs> armies and armies, which Haven't is really good one. to see, really great, you know, out on a Saturday and a Sunday for their, like you've said, weekend warrior rides. Um, you know, and those populations might be really beneficial to, to, to perhaps have that glass of milk after exercise or something of comparable nutri nutritional profile. What was the expression again? Mammal, middle-aged okay. lycra. That's, that's curious. I didn't know that one. I will uh, note it down for sure. And um, that, that context of calcium really um, makes a connection here with one of the previous podcasts we had with Dr. Nikki Key, who um, we, we were tackling the topic of uh, bone mineral health on, on cyclists. And that pro cyclists, in her research, she saw that they have very alarming low bone mineral densities as a result of low energy availability, the so-called REDS. Um, and given that the high calcium content of milk and the fact that its inclusion in the cyclist's daily diet may result in a higher fat loss, shouldn't this be an obvious choice for cyclists of all ages looking, looking to cut weight while protecting their bone health and muscle mass preservation? Yeah, I think so. I think it's uh, it's an obvious, easy source of calcium in the diet. It's, you know, readily available calcium. It's bioavailable. It's 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 it's, it's, a, it's an excellent source. And I think anyone cutting cutting out dairy uh, products, particularly cyclists, where like you say, they, there are issues with with bone mineral density and bone health in cyclists. My understanding of that is a lot of it's related to the uh, the lack of any loading on the bone. You know, mm -hmm. so. Um, anybody who, who, who runs or walks as part of their sport will will have a lot of loading that goes through the bone, and, and that seems to be one of the key key stimuli for um, promoting you know bone turnover and and, and bone health um, and stimulating kind of you know bone formation. Um, cyclists don't have that same kind of stress that they put the skeleton under. Um, so yeah, we we do see uh, often cyclists with really you know really poor bone bone health scores i mean how many times do you see someone just come off the bike and you know they've cracked a vertebrae you know it's an it's an innocuous fall small little fall and you know a collarbone goes vertebrae goes um arms wrists everything so i think this is one area that milk would be really beneficial specifically for cyclists yeah. uh, Yeah, this is a topic that still uh, shocks me because with the propensity that, that cyclists have to bone fractures and, you know, they're not protected in, in, in any way. I think, um, you know, that's the, the interesting thing with bones, obviously, is it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing as, as, as muscle. You know, it's a long term thing. It's not a quick fix. So you're talking sure. year, years of, um, you know, changing nutritional and exercise practices to, to influence that, that tissue. Um, but, yeah, I think it. It's certainly something that cyclists, how many times have you seen somebody, you know, they just even just fall off the bike, they break something and they're out of a grand tour. Yes. Um, you know, it happens so, so regularly. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's that's one area that really the, the calcium content in milk and, and the protein to a certain extent as well um, could be could be really beneficial for for the cyclist. There, there may be other strategies outside of milk. Milk's not the only answer, um, but I think it, it, it's certainly one easy um, easy, easy answer to the question. Yeah, sure. And we all have been assuming here that only a scenario in which people, athletes, do tolerate milk. But for those who don't, what would you say could be the best alternatives to consider when aiming to maximize muscle recovery, uh, improve muscle protein synthesis, and rehydration? Yeah, I think um, there, there are obviously um, milk, um, milk proteins, you know, fractions. And we've talked about ways and caseins and things like that. But I think the first thing to say is that, you know, in, in, in trying to get the, all the benefits that are in milk, and it does seem to be a whole food benefit. And I'm very, um, you know, in the UK, the English Institute of Sport, with the people that I've heard say this saying, but, you know, a food first approach. Yes. 
it's used throughout sports nutrition. And I think it's a really important mantra to get across because if you're using food first, the, the athlete automatically is getting some education about the foods that they actually consume. And I think that education in nutrition is one of the most important things for making effective dietary choices. But if you've got this approach of food first, you can start to look at other ways for people that are intolerant to certain aspects of milk to ensure that they can access all the benefits. So we talked about, you know, low lactose milk, where you've you've got the, um, you know, the enzymatic breakdown of lactose or removal of lactose and replacement with other carbohydrate sources. And you can get those type of milks. They will they will have all the other benefits, the rehydration, the you know, the calcium content, the the, the protein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, one other thing that I think will perhaps generate some interest in coming years is is this this idea of uh, milk protein intolerance. And I don't know if you've seen anything around kind of A2 milk yes. um, and the, the, the type of casein that is contained within different milks. Um, I think that's an interesting aspect to start to look at with with endurance athletes or with athletes in general to to see whether some of the intolerance associated with milk is related to the the, the, the type of the casein that's actually in the milk and where mm. where that milk has actually been derived from um outside of that clearly you know vegetarian vegan athletes are going to need to look at plant sources of, of protein and calcium and need to be aware of you know the various different amino acids that are contained in different sources and and you know how well the um, you know, calcium and other kind of micronutrients are actually absorbed from those sources. Carbohydrate is fairly ubiquitous in the uh, in the diet, Western diet at least. So we don't need to worry too much about getting sufficient carbohydrate. It's more the quality of the protein, the amount of protein, and um, ensuring adequate water intake is the other option for for rehydration. You know, um, hmm. alongside food. Um, to, to, to get some of the benefits of, of consuming food and water together on rehydration. Yeah, I don't think if you agree with me, but if there's one thing that all these food trends, you know, delivered us was alternatives. We have so many alternatives. The idea that gluten would be harmful in any way, the same for lactose, really created some really good alternatives for people who actually had celiac disease and people who actually had lactose uh, intolerance. And today, people may be benefiting from this. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, sure. There's 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 many ways to skin a cat. In the same with yeah. diet, there's many ways to achieve the same the same dietary goals from different foods, and that's the that's the real luxury that we've got. Well, the one thing that we're not lacking is different sources of food and availability of food. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty we're pretty lucky in that sense um, in living in today's day and age. Um, so yeah, so it, it's all about education and knowing which foods to choose at which time. I think that's the nice thing with milk is. You don't have to think about it. I think it's a simple, you know, strategy after any training session, go and have, you know, half a liter, 600 milliliters of, of milk and, you know, that you will achieve some of your recovery goals just simply by doing by doing that. And a final advice, what would you say to coaches, to sports nutritionists and even to cyclists who may be avoiding milk still at all costs, uh, not just not for lactose intolerant or gastrointestinal reasons, but for health concerns about its inclusion in their diet? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any health concerns about it. You know, most of those health concerns are, 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 are kind of taken out by decent legislation um in, in 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 certain countries so it depends where you live i guess and where the milk comes from but i think i would encourage all sports people to consider milk as a, a post-exercise drink um if you interrogate the evidence most of the evidence that's out there is very beneficial and positive about milk if we're looking at specific disease risk um you know longevity and the the, the profile of nutrients in milk i i only really see it as a positive Okay, perfect. Lewis, uh, if people want to uh, get in touch with you or stay or keep up with your updates on social media, where should people go to? Um, so, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, um, LJJ uh, underscore nu nutrition. Uh, other than that, um, I can be contacted through my, my, my work email address. So I'm based at Loughborough University. So if you Google Lewis James Loughborough University, you'll, 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 you'll pull up my contact details that way. Okay, perfect. I will provide uh, these contacts on, and I'll put them on the show notes of Philip Edel Podcast. Um, Lewis, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to do this. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolute pleasure to, to talk to you, Gabriel. And um, yeah, thanks for thanks for the invite to uh, to come and talk on the podcast. 
And there you go, guys. That was episode number 10. Cow's milk as a post-exercise recovery drink with Dr. Lewis James from Loughborough University. I think the message is quite clear. We are not advocating here that milk should be consumed or milk is the gold standard drink for post-exercise recovery, but it's definitely worth considering due to its convenience and nutritional profile. Including milk in your diet may also result in increased body fat loss, which may be useful in periods that the athlete needs to cut weight while preserving its lean body mass. There are of course contexts in which milk might not be useful and those include periods during exercise of course and situations in which non-lactose intolerant cyclists might feel bloated anyway when consuming milk or chocolate flavored milk in the 4 hour recovery period which may actually condition the recovery process by an excessive satiating effect at that moment. But if the cyclist tolerates chocolate milk and is able to keep on eating during that 4 hour period then chocolate milk should definitely be considered. This of course if the priority is to recover fast in multi stage racing. I hope you took many important notes from this episode and now excuse me but I gotta go pack my bags to go to Brussels. I'll see you on episode 11. Thanks for listening guys. Au revoir.